89, he came into Tennessee. They found him in a bar. Texas, he was from. In Texas, they found him in a bar, in a biker bar. He got kicked out of a few colleges for fighting. Uh, uh, Buzz Sawyer trained him originally, uh, and they had him as a punisher in Texas. His first full-time job was in Tennessee in 89. First day I saw him, he did a leapfrog on somebody, and he jumped God. You know, he's so athletic. He did the clothesline where he flies across the ring right. and did that, and he, 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 he could do that walking down the ropes sure. in the elbow then. You know, and, and of course, and, and, and worked with him. He was a natural. You know, he was a natural. Uh, what, what do you remember about him uh, outside the ring? Back then, he was a nice guy. Yeah. Before he um, come Undertaker. Now he believes he's really dead. No, but, you know, I don't know. You know, but hey, look at look at his body of work. I mean, you cannot oh, deny yeah. what this man and, and, and talented. And listen, this is no I'm a tough guy, man. Tough yeah. guy. He's one of Hell's Angels. All right, for yeah. real. Yeah, he's real deal. And and uh, uh, and, and he, he, like I said, he bounced at a badass biker bar. Ronnie Gossett's dead. He was a manager. He helped Nick Lewis to Jerry Jarrett a lot in uh, Lewisburg, Tennessee, something like that. Uh, uh, Mark sucker punched Ronnie Gossett. Mark whooped the whole front row. The whole front row. We were going to hit the ring to help him. He didn't need it. Everybody running from him. Beat the, beat the fuck out of him. I mean, just bam, bam, bam. You could, he was like, oh, big guy. He was 6'8", 300 then. When he was in Atlanta, he was finished up with to do the Suburban Commando. The movie with Hulk. Then he started as Undertaker. He was, oh, he loved him. He did. Oh, he really liked him. Didn't want him to leave. And kind of messing with him. He gave his notice. Uh, some bouncer got smart with Mark at the bar. Uh, no, some guy got got smart with Mark at the bar in Knoxville, Tennessee. We all lived in Nashville then. Mark did, Stephen, I did, and all that. And uh, uh, some big dude come up. Man, I don't know why I want to pick a fight. Mark was mad anyway. Mark dropped. I just saw across from. I just saw the guy just disappear. The guy was about as big as Mark. And then I saw another guy do something, and I saw him drop him. I saw two guys fall. And then uh, the bouncers. We got all, all the boys that over to him, and the bouncers. Mark, Mark goes, I'm going home. Get out of my way. They got out of his way. Incredible. Incredible human being. Uh, incredible person, great friend, great father. Uh, he, he's awesome, man. I, I mean, I, I, words aren't enough to describe the person that he is. My first match, very intimidating. Uh, it, it does come to a point where, where you just let it soak in, man, and, and enjoy the moment. Uh, me personally, uh, that's probably one of the matches that I never thought would happen, and it did. So um, I enjoyed every single moment of that match and the matches that were later uh, coming my way. So very, very uh, respectful. Top of, the, leader. Top, top of the line. I mean, there, it doesn't get any better. Talk about the Undertaker. What are your early memories of uh, Mark Callis when he was in Memphis? Man, you know what? He used to ride with me, and this is the funniest thing. When I did the uh, the uh, pay per view for events, it was ninety. What was it? Ninety five. Or ninety six. Ninety six. Yeah. yeah. Well, they told me everybody, I guess, has got their their own assigned dressing quarters or something, right? In which everybody always knocks Shawn Michaels or and Triple H and everything, uh, I guess, because they think they get their way. But man, when I went to that thing, they was the two coolest dudes to me. In which Shawn was always cool to me when he come through Memphis, but but I hadn't been around Hunter none until up there, and they was the two coolest dudes to me out of that whole locker room. I, and I carried Mark around. Mark rolled with me, the Undertaker, when he was in Memphis, and we hung out together and we made trips all I mean I mean four days a week together and we'd ride in my car because he didn't have enough money to put tires on his car. Huh. And then when I went up there, you know who I was assigned to be in the dressing room with? And Undertaker, Bret Hart, and myself, which they was in the main event, so maybe they thought I shouldn't be in there. But now here's a guy that was in Memphis that didn't have enough money to put tires on his car that was driving around in an escort with bald tires that rode with me every night and then I went up there and when I walked in they said which this might not have been real good either I changed my I was supposed to fly in a day early you know for the pay-per-views well I changed my flight to the day of the pay-per-view I wrestled Nashville that night I didn't fly up there I went Sunday to get there right before the pay-per-view and I walked in the room and uh I said, hey, Big Mark how you doing man I hadn't seen him since he left Memphis right so I figured he'd be nice and cool and stuff he said hey I thought, hey, here's a guy that didn't have money to put tires on his car that I carried everywhere and didn't charge him nothing. 
and then he's going to be just so so what a how many ever million dollars he's made or whatever so what right but see it's like you said it's all about what have you done for me lately i guess because yeah. he sure didn't remember that he didn't have enough money to get to the towns without me did he lighten up to you at all or was that pretty much it oh well right here we were sitting there and was getting dressed and which i just told i went up and introduced myself to bret hart because i'd never been around bret hart i saw right. i do a doug gilbert and uh he said hey and uh I said, you been doing okay, Mark? And he said, yeah. <laughs> I thought, man, fuck you. We were wrestling Taker in Japan in the Budokan, which is a very famous wrestling place there, about 15,000 people. And it was Taker's return to Japan. He hadn't been there in a long time. And when his music hit, he came in. The Budokan is... Think of a huge Elks Lodge. You know how it goes straight up like that. Right. It was an awesome entrance. I, they told me afterwards, They got the office got mad at me. Why were you smiling and laughing when Taker was entering the ring? I was like, because I was having a fucking good time. That's why, assholes. I, this is supposed to be fun. When I went to a territory, I rented apartments. Okay? It was Dusty, it was Dustin Rhodes. Okay? Dirty white boy and dirty white girl, okay? Undertaker, which is, back then it was Mark. He yeah. told us his name was Mark Jones, but I, 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 it's Mark something. Callaway. Who? Callaway. 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 Mark Callaway. We, all, we was all in the apartment. Undertaker, Undertaker was doing all of, Jerry Lawler would draw would draw a, a picture of a monster and then go have the mash made and put it on uh un, put it on Mark. And he he would wrestle as that for ever how long Jerry Lawler wanted to book him. Okay? Yeah. And and Jerry Lawler, you are no good rotten son of a sack of you know what. You know what I'm talking about. And if I'd have found you that night in the Memphis Coliseum, your your butt wouldn't have held shucks. Because when I come there, Jerry Lawler, I told you I wanted at least a guarantee, a two-week notice before you let me know, before, before you let me go. And what you you said, you yes, no problem, Bart. Come on, I need your help. I come up there in that stinking territory, and Dad Gum starved to death, of course, like we we all and. Then you give me a you give me an hour about an hour notice on my check, Jerry Lawler. I ain't happy with you, and I, I would, if I found you that night, I'd probably went I'd went to jail. I don't, I don't know what they should do with the Undertaker at this point, um, because since he already lost to Lesnar, so which I never thought he should have. I think he should have been undefeated. I mean, it's one. It was the one thing in wrestling that had legs to it. I mean, you know, not, they didn't plan to have it that way. It just worked out that way. And all of a sudden it dawned on him one day, hey, he's like 16 to 0. But, uh, and then they just protected it. And in wrestling, you know, that's the one thing is nothing's ever protected. You know, it's whenever, whenever as a kid you were watching wrestling and you'd get into a character and then of course they do the job on the way out, which for business they should, but certain people who had been there for years, like I remember like, uh, let's say Chief J Strongbow again, he was on top for 15 years, you know, for WWF or however long it was, and then got jobbed out on the way out, you know, a lot. And it's like, uh, why would they, it's like uh, tarnishes your memories, you know what I mean? And so I don't think they should have beat The Undertaker. I think they should have allowed something to be, to be remembered, something to be bigger than, you know, than wrestling. And, uh, you know, something that, has, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I just think they never should have done it. And so now what, what should they do? I don't know what they should do because if you beat them again, uh, well, yeah, you get a, you get the rub off it, but does it mean as much or does it even mean anything because it's already been done and now it's just like you're just riding a, you know, it's like you've already, the trick's already been done. We've already seen behind the curtain. We know how the lady saw it in half. So why even do it again? But then him winning is anticlimactic too. Honestly, they it's it's 
Ah, it's hard to say. They never should have beat him, my opinion.